welcome. Welcome to this online program of the American Writers Museum. Thank you all for joining us here as we continue to let people file into the room and hang up their coats and find their seats, so to speak. Come on in. My name is Allison Sansoni. I'm the direct program director here at the American Writers Museum. I've got a few short housekeeping notes while everyone's getting settled before we begin. Uh, the first of these is that if you have not yet done so, you can join the museum as a member at our website at AmericanWritersMuseum.org so that you can get advanced notice of special programs and exhibit previews, including the upcoming exhibit, Dark Testament, A Century of Black Writers on Justice, which is opening in September. Our book selling partner for this and our other events is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. And you can order tonight's book from the link that we'll post in the chat in a few minutes. We'll post it again at the end of the evening. So be sure to check that for that information. We want to thank all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. The AWM and its permanent exhibits includes many of the venerated writers of the past, and we recognize that as times change, so too does interest in different aspects of literary history. Some writers remain well known throughout the years, others come into popularity, fall out of it again, and are rediscovered time after time by those seeking the relevance of their words. Tonight's program looks at two writers whose popularity rose and fell during their own lifetimes and many times afterwards, as well as about the reckoning with modernity that both addressed in their work. In Up From the Depths, Aaron Sachs tells the interconnected stories of novelist Herman Melville and one of his earliest biographers, the literary critic and historian Lewis Mumford. Mumford helped spearhead Melville's revival in the aftermath of World War I and the 1918 flu pandemic, when American culture needed to forbear with a suitably dark vision. His work on Melville's biography reminded Americans that darkness was balanced with a fierce determination to endure despair and persevere. Dr. Sachs is a professor of history and American studies at Cornell University. He's the author of The Humboldt Current, 19th Century Exploration and the Roots of American Environmentalism, and Arcadian America, the Death and Life of an Environmental Tradition. We're so pleased to have him here with us tonight, and let's welcome him back into the room. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that lovely introduction, um, and thanks to everybody in the Zoom room. It's great. It's great to see everyone. I understand to, to start us off, you, you have a, a portion of the book you'd like to read for us. Yeah, um, and what I'm really looking forward to is the conversation, but yeah, I thought it would be great to, to just start off with a little hint of the book. Um, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to give too much away, so I'm starting with something very early from the book. It's, it's actually from chapter one, the beginning of chapter one, and the title of chapter one is Loomings, which many of you probably know um, is also the chapter title um, for the very first chapter of Moby Dick. And I have to say one of the most fun things about doing this project was just consistently stealing words and phrases from Melville, um, which I think he would have approved of because he, he did a lot of that himself. Uh, but anyway, so this is uh, chapter one, um, Loomings. Do you know any optimistic historians? There aren't many. Spend almost any length of time studying the past and the rosiest conclusion you'll come to is that our record is, well, mixed. Every time we take 100 steps forward, we take 99 back and it's unclear where the next one is going to land. For every scholar willing to claim that, say the 1950s were a great era in American history, when the income gap closed and opportunity knocked at everyone's door, a hundred others will remind you that not everyone had a door, that there was a war in Korea, that some veterans were drinking too much and beating their wives, that women were kept from the workforce, that African-Americans were kept from voting, that children grew up with air raid drills, that artists were blacklisted and intellectuals jailed for controversial opinions that synagogues were bombed, that radiation and toxic chemicals were seeping into everyone's bodies. Sorry, I feel like I should have warned you that we were gonna plunge right into the Melvillian abyss, um, but I promise we will we'll come up again. <laughs> um, because 
pessimism does not exclude the possibility of hope because history teaches that things do shift. The most dour among us will argue that all change just represents entropy, the inevitable drift toward further chaos. But then why didn't nature reclaim our cities centuries ago? Yes, we are part of the chaos, but we also sometimes struggle against it. We create culture, make meaning, insist on ideals like liberty, equality, and solidarity, sometimes with startling, unpredictable success. Lewis Mumford's first book, published in 1922, just before he turned 27, was the story of utopias. It was, of course, a story of failure because utopia is an impossible dream. But the point was the value of the dreamer, the restless striving toward collective thriving, the determined envisioning of alternatives to hierarchy and domination. If there was no such thing as a perfect place, there could at least be a good place, like the TV show, um, which Mumford sometimes referred to as utopia with an E at the beginning, drawing on the Greek root in words like eulogy and euphonious. And he argued that our collective will to utopia was in fact the only thing preventing society's disintegration. Predictably, for the rest of his life, Mumford would have to fend off the label of dreamy utopian, and that drove him crazy. In his 1940 book, Faith for Living, he included an entire chapter called Life is Better Than Utopia. And when he issued a new edition of the, stories, of the, the story of utopias in 1962, he cantankerously reminded his readers that my utopia is actual life. What he always returned to was the need in any half decent society to protect people's ability to protest and resist, to contest dominant values, which so often serve merely to keep the powerful in power. Unlike utopian writers, he said, I must find a place in any proposed scheme for challenge and opposition and conflict. In short, to be a utopian with an E meant to believe in the constant open renegotiation of what the good society should be in the face of stiffening conventions and constraints, meant embracing hope despite what he called ever looming ordeals of reality. That phrase ordeals of reality is another chapter title from the very last book Mumford published a memoir he wrote just before the onset of dementia. And that phrase, ordeals of reality, referred to the period when he was working on his Melville biography from 1927 to 1929. He started work on the Melville project under congenial circumstances. Summer, Martha's Vineyard, with his wife, Sophia, and their two-year-old son, in, as he said, a shabby little shack on a lonely heath. The sea, again in his words, was their constant companion, washing against the cliffs, whispering or roaring, soothing or threatening, advancing or retreating. And nearby was an ancient tree-lined farm worked by two elderly women. Mumford delighted in the flow and ebb, the stimulation and repose of the landscape. A ridge of sandy cliffs skirting the shores for a couple of miles until they sank into dunes marked the abrupt end of the land. And at the bottom of these cliffs, we sunned ourselves and bathed. It was a refuge, a retreat. Many members of the lost generation escaped the trauma of the First World War by immersing themselves in nature and seeking inspiration from the past. Up to this point, Mumford had been ensconced in New York City and he still lived there in the fall, winter and spring. But in his writing throughout the 1920s, he had already begun to search historical landscapes for ways of transcending his life amid skyscrapers and offsetting his society's fixation on power and conquest. Unlike most 1920s intellectuals though, who generally looked to Europe for alternatives to the conservatism 
dominating the United States, Mumford dove ever deeper into American cultural history. After the story of utopias, he published Sticks and Stones, a study of American architecture and civilization, in which he proposed the classic Massachusetts village as, in his words, the embodiment of a highly intelligent partnership between the earth and man. Then in his breakthrough book, The Golden Day, a study in American literature and culture, Mumford wrote even more yearningly of old New England, celebrating the efflorescence of imagination in the 1840s and 50s, noting the outdoor energy of antebellum poetry and prose, the embrace of both science and art, modernity and timelessness. The Golden Day established writers like Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, Hawthorne, Poe, and Melville as the archetypal American geniuses, sparking a new scholarly movement to appreciate what we now call the American Renaissance. The clear heroes of that book were Emerson and Whitman, and either could easily have served as the subject of a new biography. But Mumford chose Melville. Perhaps he wanted to embrace tragedy as openly as possible to shake off the public's perception that he was primarily a nostalgic utopian. Perhaps he truly craved a dose of darkness, found it exhilarating to follow Melville in Mumford's words in a flight over an unconquered and perhaps an unconquerable abyss. Or perhaps he wanted to redeem Melville as he said, Melville's perplexities, his defiances, his torments, his questions, even his failures, all have a meaning for us. Thanks, I'm gonna stop there and uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. I, I wanted to start us off with a, a little bit of a, a chicken or an egg question. Um, how did you, How did you come to, to this subject, was it an interest in Melville or Mumford or both? Um, definitely both. I, I have about 10 different origin stories for this book. Um, and, uh, you know, the probably the, the, the simplest one to tell is that um, in 2004, I was at the Friends of the Library book sale in Ithaca, New York, and it was my first semester as a professor and I was quite dazed. I had an 11 month old son. Um, and, um, and I saw on the bookshelf, what seemed to be a biography of Melville by Lewis Mumford. And I really almost I, I did one of these like, really? <laughs> um, because I knew both writers, but I didn't know about this biography. I had read other books by Lewis Mumford. I had read a lot of Melville. Um, but anyway, I, I, I picked it up and I was hooked and, um, and, I, and, and that just the existence of that biography and then the discovery that it actually it made a huge difference in the Melville revival um, just made me think a lot about, uh, you know, what was going on. It would, made me think historically what was going on in the 1920s to make it so that Melville seemed like such an incredibly relevant writer. Yeah, what, what was happening in the world that, that we went back to a whaling ship? Yeah, especially since, you know, what, what do you learn about the 20s? You hear it's the roaring 20s. It's, you know, it's the great explosion of the American economy and consumer, uh, the consumer society and, and all of that. But turns out to have been a, a, a darker time. And, and that was that was one of Mumford's um, sort of obsessions was always to think about the countercurrents in, in any given moment. You know, we, we, when, when we're sort of uh, cash, casually thinking back to the history of the 20th century, we say the Roaring Twenties and then the Depression hit. And one of Mumford's ideas was like, you know what, the Roaring Twenties wasn't so great after all, but that also helps us see the positive side of things that were going on in the 1930s during the Depression. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, you know, we, we've looked at a lot back at a lot of writing that took place in the 20s and, and what we think of as excess makes perfect sense to us now after the past two years as a, as a trauma response, doesn't it? It's, you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, that makes a lot of more sense to me than it did before. 
Yeah, that, and, and, and Mumford thought really, really hard about trauma at, the, at both the personal and the societal level. And, um, you know, he, he, was, he, he wrote the, the Melville biography, which, which, which actually sent him into a deep depression because he, because Melville was so dark. <laughs> um, and then the depression hit. And, um, and, and, you know, everyone was traumatized, but then the, the great, he, he has this moment, um, he wrote a book immediately after the Melville biography called The Brown Decades. And it, it's a really extraordinary book, came out in 1930. And there's this moment where he's sort of thinking out loud in the book and realizing like, you know what, this, the depression, when it hit in 1929, it felt awfully similar to what happened right after World War I. 1919 was a dismal year in American history with lynchings and uh, just, you know, all sorts of rioting, um, really, really, really terrible stuff. And, um, and a lot of Melville Circle felt like it was the beginning of a new dark time. Um, and he started to really think cyclically um, and, and realize that, you know, even, even though in our culture we're trained to think that time is only linear and, and um, we just move, you know, constantly forward and, you know, the past is, is irrelevant and, and anyway irretrievable because we've come so far from those dark days of history. But Mumford started thinking, no, it's, there's, there, there's also a great deal of continuity and it's worth sort of thinking about that dialectic between linear and cyclical time. Yeah. One of the, the things that we really grapple with at the American Writers Museum is the idea of relevance, that not all, not every writer from history is still read today. So how are writers, so how writers are chosen to become part of the American canon, how they're considered in their time and in ours are both of you know, of great interest to us. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, the sort of Melville Renaissance that, you, that you've alluded to and, and how Mumford played a role in, in spurring that. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, so like I said, it, it, um, 1919 was a, was a terribly dark year in a lot of ways in American society. It also happened to be the centennial of Melville's birth. Um, and a couple of obscure literary scholars noticed that um, and, um, and, and sort of just started writing an article here and there about Melville to say like, you know, maybe, maybe there could be something um, in the sky. Um, and especially for this dark time. Um, and, and it just sort of caught on. Uh, the first biography was by Raymond Weaver in 1921. And it really, it, it, was, it was literally a rediscovery because Melville had been just utterly forgotten. Not, not only since he died in 1891, but for the last few decades of his life, when he was still, when he was still alive, a lot of people thought he had already died because he was so obscure. Um, so, um, so there were no biographies written of him until Raymond Weaver came along in 1921. And, um, and then there was this explosion. People, people did find him to be uh, very, very relevant, germane to, to the times. Um, and, um, and Mumford was just starting his career in the early 1920s. And, um, and initially was much more attracted to Emerson and Whitman. Um, but then uh, after Weaver's biography came out and, um, and he started, started really thinking about this period that we now call the American Renaissance in the 1830s and 40s and 50s in, in New England with all of those and New York with all of those amazing writers. Um, and he started, he started thinking like, you know, some of them really understood injustice in uh, in different and more powerful ways. Just just as as an example, the um, the the injustice surrounding especially slavery um, in those times. Melville has a huge amount to say about slavery. And just to give you one concrete example of why that resonated in the 1920s 
the KKK, which had been fairly dormant in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, exploded again suddenly in the 1920s. Um, it was a it was a really a very conservative period in in a lot of ways, an anti-immigrant period. Um, and Melville also has a great deal to say about immigrants and um, and you know the the sort of the rights that immigrants have in coming. Um, to the United States in the 19th century. Um, so anyway, uh, Mumford saw the, the whole period, the antebellum period in a much darker light after reading more Melville and thinking about him and, um, and then wrote this biography which came out in 1929 and sort of supplanted Raymond Weaver's work and became the go-to book about Melville that then spurred even more scholarly work. There was really an ex just an explosion of, of scholarly work about Melville through the 30s and 40s, and then especially surrounding 1951, which was the centenary of Moby Dick. Um, that's, that's the moment when you could say Melville was finally canonized. Yeah. We, in reading your book and, and you know, and listening to, to you talk now, I, we think of these reconsiderations of the classics as something new, something, you know, we've never done before. We talk about it as if it's some sort of betrayal of the past, but I think your, your book makes it clear that these, considera these reconsiderations have been happening all along throughout literary history and, and in every era, looking back and saying is, does this writer still have something to say? And Mumford seems to have settled pretty definitively on, on yes, to that Melville did have something to say in his time. And you are, in your writing, are saying that Mumford and Melville both have something to say to us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I hope there will be a, a, a Mumford revival. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's incredibly relevant right now. But yeah, the, the broader point that you're making is really, really important. And, um, and it's something that, that Mumford wrote a lot about. Bas basically, the idea is we constantly have to be going back and rethinking our relationship to the past. It's, it's really like the, the past is always with us. It's if, even though we live in this culture where we often deny that in subtle and, and unsubtle ways, it's there. It's, a, it's affecting us every single day. Um, and if we don't rethink, renegotiate that relationship, then we're sort of, you know, the more powerless to, to deal with that uh, influence. And that includes rethinking, you know, who should be in, in any sort of canon, if you're, if you're going to have a literary canon in the first place. But, um, but that, that process has been so important through time. And, and each generation really has to have its own active, constructive relationship to the past and, and past writers. Um, you, can, you can see this in sort of obvious ways with regard to um, recovering, for instance, African-American writers, women writers, all sorts of people from uh, various minority groups who just were ignored in the past. Um, that's a fairly straightforward kind of uh, recovery or rediscovery or renegotiation. Um, but then there, there are also important ways of renegotiating that relationship that, uh, that address sort of more subtle things. You know, the, the way that Melville turned out to have a kind of modernist sensibility before modernism existed. And that, that's another reason uh, people were so excited about him is that he had a way of writing that was um, often panned at the time. You know, the the the, the, cl the classic reviews of Moby Dick say like, "Look, either give us a really good story about the chase after a white whale, or give us a whaling manual. We don't want both at the same time." Um, and that's just what modernists tend to that kind of thing, that kind of interweaving of of different uh, different sorts of things is just what modernists tend to want. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's that, that act of rediscovery can be incredibly helpful and illuminating uh, at any moment in history. Yeah. I, I don't want to say contrarian because that sort of implies a, you know, a kind of knee-jerk reactionism, but I, I, I am interested in the idea that they both looked at the prevailing sentiment of the day and decided to interrogate that rather than go along to get along. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, Melville, Melville said explicitly that he wanted to write the, the kind of books that would be seen as failures because um, he was so just sort of frustrated by, I mean, the, the, the market economy was fairly new. Um, the, the, the idea that you could even make a living potentially as a writer was fairly new, but it was really, really, really hard. And, um, and there were all these commercial concerns that people wanted him to take into consideration. And there were some books he wrote, you know, in, in order to try to make a living. Um, but, but then, you know, he, he also wrote works that were just, you know, like, <laughs> um, let's say really displeasing to <laughs> the majority of, of his readers because they were so different from what was expected. And the, the um, you know, I think, I think part of that was a kind of contrariness in a way. Um, it was, it was basically to say, screw you to the market and to the, to the obligation to, uh, to exist in this market economy. Um, but also, you know, to see it in a more positive light, it was an expression of who he really was. Um, you know, he was, he was the kind of person who got very, very involved in his characters and his stories, but also, you know, um, really cared about the whaling manuals, you know, really wanted to learn uh, about the world and, uh, and, you know, how it worked, you know. So, so Mo Moby Dick is this great symbol. It's this symbol uh, that that has, you know, um, allowed for countless interpretations. But at the same time, in the book, it's an actual living whale. In an eco, you know, the the word ecology wasn't around yet, but like in an ocean ecology, which is described in great detail and and uh, and subtlety in the book. Um, so yeah, anyway, con contrarian, but, but also just trying to be true to himself. And, and, and Mumford was the same way. I want to, to move into talking a little bit about, um, about your own writing process. Um, you, you move back and forth between Melville's story and Mumford's. How did you decide to structure this book and give weight to different aspects of their lives? Thank you so much for asking that question because I, I really I care a lot about that um, and and again I, I have many many different responses um, and and maybe we can sort of gradually go through a few of them as as we exchange ideas about this but um, but for starters you know it, it is meant to to be an homage to the kind of writing that Melville often did as in Moby Dick there's there's that sort of interwovenness, that alternating effect um, that I think is very, very powerful. And, um, and it, it just, it makes you follow uh, the thread of the story in a, in a different way. You're, you never quite know what's going on. I like, I actually like my reader to be a little bit lost and then, um, and then sort of offer up some orientation gradually so that, so that they're kind of making connections along with me as they're reading. Um, so that's, that's one answer. Uh, and then one other one that I'll just sort of underline for now um, has to do with, again, this question of time and change and continuity. Um, I really, I, you know, I, I, I had things to say about how each of these writers developed over time, they both they both have a chronological trajectory in the book, um, but just as important uh, as that to me was the resonances between their lives and work and time periods. Um, so I, I, I already mentioned that realization that Mumford had in 1929, like, oh, the Great Depression is not that much of a shock because it feels very similar actually to 10 years ago. Another sort of, uh, realization that he had layered on top of that was, oh, and those two shocks were not as different um, as you might think from the shock of the Civil War, the trauma of the Civil War. You know, he, he says explicitly, I, I realized I could only understand my time 
once I went back and studied what was happening in the 19th century and the way that people tried to recover from the shock of the Civil War. Um, so those kinds of resonances, and there, there are many more examples, but, but just that, that basic idea that, um, that there's this continuity as well as change and, and they're, they're woven together and uh, the past is always with us in the present. That was something I really wanted to explore structurally, not just thematically. I, I, I've always really loved books where, where the form of the book somehow fits with the substance of the book. And that was what I was going for. Were you aware of all of those points of connection when you began or were there things that emerged in your research that you said, oh my goodness, they, you know, they were, look at, the, look at all of these commonalities? Um, definitely both. Yeah, there were, there were some things that had, uh, that had leapt to mind as soon as I started thinking about the project. Um, you know, for, like I, I mentioned that book, The Brown Decades is, is full of these resonances. Um, but, um, but yeah, also a lot of them only came to light as I did more and more research, not only reading their public works, but going into the archives and, and reading uh, as many private writings. I mean, all, all of Melville is, is published um, at this point, um, although his, he burned a lot of his documents. Um, and so uh, there's, a, there's just a lot we don't know about his life and his thoughts. <laughs> um, Memf Mumford is the opposite. He's really over-documented. He kept note of everything and, and, and kept journals all through his life. Um, but those were really, really fun and interesting to read. Um, just to, and, and, and he was incredibly honest with himself in his private writings. Um, but yeah, um, some of some of the the resonances in their lives are are really kind of uncanny, um, and uh, and it it became it became important to me to 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 really sort of try to work that through in this text and and see you know what further meanings I could make from that. Um, I'll just just to uh, that sounded a little abstract. So just to give you one example, one of the things I realized um, is that both of these men really, really cared about the idea of relationships or relationality and, um, and their marriages were incredibly important. Uh, and so um, I really wanted to, to get um, the voices of their wives into the book um, as much as possible. And I, I wound up having two chapters at the very end of the book it, it so happened that both men died and then their wives were left to sort of reflect on their lives and think about their legacy. Um, and, um, and so I, I hope in those two chapters at the end that uh, you, you, can, you can really see some of the similarities between the two relationships and, and also some of the differences that were, you know, related to historical changes, um, but also, of course, just personal differences. Did you imagine an audience for this book as you were writing it? Were you were you anticipating that many people would be fans of one or both, or um, were you primarily writing for scholars, or or both? Yeah, I mean, um, I I I try always to write for a broad audience. Um, you know, I I hope that there's plenty there for scholars, but I hope there's also plenty there for anybody who is interested in Melville or anyone who's interested in Mumford or anyone who's interested in, you know, what it means to think historically and, and be in a uh, constructive relationship with the past. Um, so, so yeah, um, pretty broad and, um, and, and, you know, I took, took some direct inspiration in that from Mumford who really tried to be a public intellectual um, all through basically almost, almost all of the 20th century. Um, you know, really did some incredibly deep scholarly work, but, um, but also really tried to be a force in his culture. We're getting a couple of questions coming into the Q&A box, which is great. Um, we're gonna chat for just a little bit more, but um, while you're listening, if you have a question, please type it into that box at the bottom of your screen and we'll read some of yours out. 
Something that, that struck me as I was reading is about the round and round and round of history and pandemic and war and modernization was that both writers had this idea about communal obligation and to, to endure to better oneself, to make the world better for others, to honor nature. A lot of these things are being written about today. And I'm wondering what Melville and Mumford both have to say to us about our current moment. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, there's there's so much to say, but 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 I'll just I'll start with the image of the ship um, that comes up in so many of Melville's works. You know, it's this um, it, it, it's this place where you can very very clearly see hierarchy. Right, because there's a captain, there are first mates, there are second mates, there's all down the line and everybody, it's, it's, it's pretty militaristic, even if it's not a military ship. Um, and Melville was keenly aware of that, suffered from that in his own experiences as a sailor. Um, and yet he found there to be this incredible potential for solidarity and, um, and understanding across difference. Moby Dick, I mean, Moby Dick is about so Moby Dick is about everything, I guess. But um, but one of the things it's about is uh, is cross cultural understanding. You have people on uh, the Pequod from all over the world with all kinds of different backgrounds, um, and Melville consistently explores in the novel what it takes to sort of cross over those differences. And it's not he doesn't make it easy, right? I mean, when when Ishmael and Queequeg. Uh, first encounter each other, they almost kill each other, or at least they're afraid, uh, Ishmael's afraid that Queequeg is going to kill him and eat him. Um, but eventually they, they wind up rubbing foreheads together and feeling as though they are mar married, wedded together. Um, and, um, and this also, you know, the, the Melville is also very, very aware of indiv American individualism. Um, he calls everybody on the Pequot an isolado. Um, and yet, as they go forth on this mission, even though it's a strange mission, he says they become federated along one keel. They're all, they're, they're all in it together. Um, they find commonality. And you know, in a way, they find commonality in the face of severe threats um, and, uh, and you know, under the, the sort of cloud of, uh, of these hierarchies and, um, and this sense of danger. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I could go on and on, but that's, but maybe let that stand as, as one example of, um, of how Melville thought about, you know, the, the division that there, there are always going to be divisions in society. It's going to be hard. Um, but, um, but, you know, one of the things I love about him is that, uh, he always looked for that sense of possibility, even, uh, even in the direst circumstances. And Mumford? Yeah, okay. Um, so <laughs> uh, lots of examples to choose from, um, but Mumford, I would say even more than Melville was relentlessly constructive. I mean, he, he really, he, he's willing to go dive into the abyss, but then insists on, he's, you know, he sort of says in so many words, you have to remember to come up out of the abyss. Um, and try to make something out of this confrontation with reality. Try to offset um, all of the, the, the forces of evil and wrong um, that are inevitably going to be there in society. There's, there's, there's a kind of determined realism that, that I think both of these authors really uphold. Um, and for Mumford, maybe the best example is just the idea of the city. Um, I think the He's, he's often been mischaracterized as simply a critic of the city because he does, you know, he, he takes a very, very hard look at the injustices of the city, the poverty of the city, the, the, um, the way that, you know, some people have access to green spaces and other people don't. Um, but, you know, he takes that criticism and uh, tries to reimagine what a city can be. He says, let's, let's go from the megalopolis example to a series of sort of small to medium sized garden cities with lots of green spaces interwoven throughout them. 
And, you know, with some industry, uh, people can maybe walk to work um, and also some wilderness on the immediate outskirts of the city. Um, basically just, you know, take, taking what is truly a mess, the, the, the urban scene by uh, the early to mid 20th century was really, really problematic. Um, and saying, we're not gonna give up on it. We're going to make it worth everybody's while and uh, as equally as possible. Well, we have, um, we have time for a few audience questions. Um, we've got a couple coming in. So we'll, uh, we'll read some of those out. Folks, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, let's start with this one from Seth Murray. What do you think the likelihood is that history and literature seminars will turn again to thinkers like Mumford, I'm gonna butcher these names, I apologize, Mathieson, Mathieson? Van Wyck, Brooks, et al. As you surely know, they were denounced by the new Americanists in the 1960s as nationalists, exceptionalists, and purged from reading lists. Do you think we are approaching a moment when they might be brought back into the fold as more than negative examples of how not to do criticism? Um, I sure hope so. I mean, I, you know, the, the um, this is the thing with, with, canon formation, right? And, and there are only so many people we can read at any given time. And, and, and you know, I'll be totally honest here. I, I had conversations with other scholars and editors um, where some of them said to me like, you, do you really need to write another book about two dead white guys? Um, you know, and, and uh, I, have, I have some complicated answers to that, but, um, but the, the overarching point is that it's really important to, to take a new fresh look at old uh, discarded writers because you never know what you might find. Um, and I think one of, one of the most important things about Mumford, even though um, you know, he, did, he did get dismissed, um, is that uh, he took a long, he, 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 I, I don't think if you read him carefully, you could ever describe him as uh, a nationalist or, or an apologist for, uh, for American culture. Um, in almost every book he wrote, he talks about the, the sort of fundamental crimes of American history against African Americans and Native Americans. Um, and you know, the, the, these, are, these are the things he most wants his readers to reckon with in a way. Um, and I think that's, you know, like I, I, I have some passages in the book where I say like this, this language would, would make perfect sense at a 21st century environmental justice rally. Um, so, you know, sometime, sometimes um, the, the cultural politics of, of choosing who we read and, and who we don't read is, is they're very complicated. And, and sometimes the reasons don't make sense when you look at them again uh, a certain number of years later. It's, you know, it, it's, it reminds me of, you know, the, a good book finding you when you most need it, that we tend to find writers when we need them. And obviously Mumford found that in, in Melville. Absolutely, and it's the same with teachers. Um, you know, I've uh, I was I was thinking um, as uh, as as I was uh, you know imagining what we would talk about tonight. I was I was realizing another origin story for this book goes back exactly twenty years um, when I listened to one of my most cherished uh, mentors, John Demos, give a series of three lectures, two thousand and two. Um, and they became, they, those lectures became a book called Circles and Lines. Um, those lectures were about, you know, linear time and, and cyclical time and, and how in the Western world, cyclical time used to be the dominant way of, of thinking about time in the past. And then linearity sort of gradually took over in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and I really, you know, it's, it's not often that, um, you sit at an academic lecture realizing that the wiring in your brain is changing, but that, that was my experience. And I, I sort of realized that I've been trying to work through those questions of cyclical and linear time and change and continuity um, 
since those lectures and, and they really came to the fore in this book. Um, so, um, so yes, writers, writers and teachers, I've, I've been so grateful at different times and students too, you know, I, I, uh, sometimes just exactly the right student comes along and that's an amazing experience as well. It's incredible to be able to recognize that moment while it's happening rather than looking back later and seeing mm -hmm. that something was foundational. Yeah, I have a, a question from uh, Robert Johnston, um, who's a fan. Uh, he says, a major reason you're such a brilliant and moving writer is because you situate your own self so vividly in your prose. To what extent have you done this, done so in this new book? Thanks, Robert. Um, that's very kind of you to say. Uh, and um, and it, it has been traditionally a a part of my method to, um, to try to sort of write honestly as a, as a participant, as it were, in the history that I'm trying to, uh, to make, uh, to construct, as opposed to just pretending to be a, an omniscient narrator. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's been important to, to kind of implicate myself. Um, at the same time, uh, as Robert well knows, and, and I'm sure many of the other people um, listening, um, that can be a, a very complicated and controversial approach um, to writing history for, for some people. And, um, and in my, my previous book, Arcadian America, which is from 2013, um, it's really, a, you know, I would say maybe like, 65% history and 35% memoir. It's really, it's very, very personal. And a number of the reviewers said like, gee, this would be a great history book if there weren't so much in it about the author. Um, and, um, and I don't wanna say that uh, that influenced me over much, um, but just in, in terms of my own thinking about how to write books, um, I actually found myself feeling this time that it would be interesting to keep myself mostly out of it um, and see where that took me. And I do, you know, I do come into it. There are certain places where I come into it, um, especially at the end. Um, but uh, but you know, it's um, it just it felt like the the sort of thing where I I really wanted uh, to create this constant juxtaposition between my two main characters. And I thought, you know, if I'm in there too much, then the, the, the kind of, there would be more of a triangular effect. And I, and I really just, I wanted to think through uh, the question of Melville and Mumford and their relation to each other. But thank you for the question. The question from uh, Rebecca who wants to know, what would Mumford say about Pip? Mumford does talk about Pip, um, who was uh, the African American, young African American aboard the Pequod and Moby Dick. And um, you know, one of one of the things that Mumford does really, really well is historicize Melville. Um, and so, basically, about about Pip, um, you know, I, the the immediate thing I would say is that uh, Pip represents one of Melville's responses to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Um, but, because, uh, you know, Pip actually throws himself overboard to escape the madness of, uh, of what's going on in the Pequod. Um, but, but, you know, just to sort of follow through on this question of um, Mumford's historicization, I think nowadays, and, and really ever since the 1950s, there's been a tendency to understand Melville in, in sort of timeless universal terms. You know, he's this great philosopher, poet, um, and any, you know, any time period can, uh, can gain something from reading Melville. Um, but that wasn't the case for most of the Melville revival. What was so extraordinary about Mumford's approach and, uh, and many of the other revivalists is that they really placed Melville in his place and time and really tried to understand how he was responding um, to the, the sort of forces of modernization in the mid 19th century. And then what's so extraordinary about that is to, is to be able to see like, wow, a lot of those forces of modernization were continuing on into the 20th century, taking different forms in some cases, but being really relevant so that um, 
you know, it's not, it's not timelessness, it's actually the, the precise timing that matters in his relevance to other time periods. I have a question here from Amy, who says, hi, Aaron, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about the challenge of the interwoven approach. I know Craig Harling's book was an inspiration. Could you share some about that and comment on maybe one of the scarier dimensions of trying to write this way? that readers might want to track one of the stories and not the other in a structure like this. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely right. Um, she's referring to uh, a book that I had the great privilege of editing. Um, John Demos and I co-edit uh, a book series for Yale University Press called New Directions in Narrative History. And um, one of the books that uh, we got to publish in that series was called Conversions by Craig Harleen, who is a history professor at BYU. And this book is just an extraordinary book that alternates between 17th century Holland and 20th century US. Um, and, um, and it tells, uh, tells the story of uh, two young men struggling with um, various kinds of conversion, but you know, switch basically switching religions because they're so called, um, you know, in 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 their own sort of spirit, uh, and then they have to deal with what happens with their family members who cannot understand why they would uh, abandon their family's faith, um, and it's it's even more complicated than that. But that's the basic story, and, um, and of course. 17th century Holland and 20th century US are vastly different societies, but what really stands out in the book is the resonances between these two deeply human stories. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I found that incredibly powerful. It was one of the most direct, that's another origin story for the book. Um, you know, I really wanted to experiment with that. Uh, and, um, and even though, you know, I think, Historians tend really, you know, it's like when you ask a historian, what do you study? The, the most common answer is change over time, um, which fair enough, but there's also continuity over time that's important to uh, consider. Um, anyway, putting, putting that idea of the sort of dialectic of change and continuity into the structure of the book, as Amy suggested, yes, it felt scary at times, um, and um, and I had, you know, I think at least so so Princeton University Press, um, which published the book, sent it out to four a total of four peer reviewers, and at least two of them said, you know, you got to get rid of this silly um, alternating structure. Just tell tell Melville's story and then tell Mumford's story. Um, because it's confusing to go back and forth like this. And, um, and I sort of, you know, had some constructive negotiations with the editor, we talked it through and I, I made my case. And, um, and I think, you know, maybe, maybe the most important thing strategically, which was in my head from the very beginning and which I got from Craig Harleen's book is that you gotta keep the chapter short. Um, because you don't want to get too involved and in, so involved in one story that you forget what's going on in the other story. Um, but the other thing is, and I, I've hinted at this before, um, is just to say that uh, you know chapters don't they, they for um, and there there uh, are many many examples of this, but I'll just go back to Moby Dick for one. Sometimes when you're reading a book and a new chapter starts and something completely different is happening, it can be really fun. Like it can be a great effect. Um, I read a lot of fiction and I, I take a lot of inspiration from fiction. And I've always thought nonfiction doesn't have to be that different, you know, like why not try this out in nonfiction and see what happens. So, um, so again, like I actually like it when um, when the reader might feel, and I like this as a reader, um, uh, when the reader might feel a little bit disoriented at the beginning of the chapter, and then gradually you get into this pattern, you, you know that like anything could happen at the beginning of the next chapter. And part of the fun is seeing how it eventually comes to connect. 
Um, so yes, and and you know there have already been a few reviews um, of of this book that have come out, and I'm really glad to to note that most of them actually like you know have wound up liking the alternating chapters, although one said it was too confusing. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know like my 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 hope is always that if if you sort of bear with it, it, it will be really rewarding because, because in most chapters, there's a kind of aha moment, like, oh, this is how it connects. Um, so I hope, I hope readers will have that experience. Time for one more question. Um, and it's from Noah, who wants to know, um, to what extent do you see Melville influencing modern American writers? And what role do you think he could play in influencing American literature in the future? As America goes on to face both recurring challenges that existed back then, as well as new ones. Yeah, thanks, Noah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I really, I, I, I think that, um, especially with some of the uh, issues surrounding race that, uh, that we've already touched on in this conversation. Um, it's really, really worth thinking about um, how, how Melville sort of um, expressed his uh, just frustration with people he considered in his circle, right? The fairly well-intentioned, often Northerners, um, white folks who were just sort of being trained in American culture to look away from the awful things that were happening. That's, this, is, this is one of the things that, that Melville noticed about modernity. Um, it was basically that you know, a lot of his fellow citizens were becoming so enchanted with the, the sort of various um, quote unquote advances in technology and, and just the, the, all the accomplishments of modernity, which can be quite exhilarating, um, that they, they, they almost like had a pact with themselves that they would then look away from um, all of the horrors that, uh, that still existed and that were even created by modernity. Um, I, have, I have a quote from James Baldwin in the in the book, and and I you know like it it may sound strange, but I think Baldwin and Melville were were sort of doing a, the same thing in a lot of their writing, basic basically saying, "Listen, privileged white folks, uh, you are the you you are the ones who are responsible. Your your assumption of innocence is the most important problem here." Um, there's a kind of reckoning that has to happen. There's, a, there's an awakening that has to happen. There's, a, in a sense, a disenchantment uh, that has to happen. Um, and uh, I think that that's incredibly powerful for our current moment. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I'll leave it at that, but, but also just very quickly signal that some of the stylistic things that Melville does, um, I think, are, are, are also um, very much present in contemporary fiction and nonfiction. Um, that that sense of interweaving difference um, is is you know some uh, a, a kind of profound structural technique that that I find very very moving and effective in a lot of the writing, a lot of the contemporary writing that I read. I want to thank you for uh, this extraordinary conversation. It's a, a wonderful event. And uh, I'm going to direct people back to the chat window where I put a link to our book selling partner at Seminary Co-op so that you can order your copy of, of Up From the Depths. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And thank you, Aaron. And thank you. This was such uh, a privilege to get to do this. I'm really grateful. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you.